Do you struggle with fear, anxiety, or maybe even depression in your spiritual life? If so, this video is for you. Well, greetings and welcome to Simply Christ. Please make sure to subscribe, to like, to share this with your friends, and also to leave a comment. It would be greatly appreciated. In just a moment, we're going to look at six life-changing actions that you can take, that we can take, for us to experience the fullness of the life in Christ. Before we do so, let's begin with a prayer. Father, thank you for the blessings in the spiritual realm. Help us to live the life that you have given us. Give us the power, that grace, God. Father, help us to understand that you have given us a life, and you want us to experience it in abundance. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you a question. How is your spiritual life? I'm not talking about the amount of times that you go to church or Bible study. Now, yes, those things are important. Don't misunderstand me. But what I mean and what I'm asking is how are you dealing with life? How is your reaction to life? What is your reaction? Are you always anxious? Are you always angry? Are you always experiencing difficulty and not being able to handle it in the right way? Do you have anger? Do you have frustration, anxiety, depression? Or are you courageous? Are you living a life of peace, of joy, of patience, of kindness? Are you taking those, no matter the circumstances in life, you are able to deal with them in a joyful and a peaceful way, the way that Christ would handle it. The good news is, is that Jesus wants to give us what we need to overcome life. In fact, that's one of Jesus's missions on earth, is to give us life. We know that Jesus came to die and to raise uh, from the dead, and many times we look at that as some type of spiritual transaction that happens in the heavens, in the heavenly courts. But the real message that we find in the New Testament, and even in the Old, but focusing on Jesus' words, is that He wants for us to live, to become sons and daughters of God. And He also come, came to, gave us, uh, to give us the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, so we can live a life that makes that helps us make godly decisions. We're able to live life in a godly way, in a way that we can handle things. Now, we're going to look at these different steps about what we can take so we can enjoy this kind of life if you're not experiencing that. But before we do that, we need to build on a good foundation. A foundation, of course, is extremely important. What kind of foundation do you have? Is your foundation of maybe sand, or is it made of rock? Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount talked about foundation, and the foundations he talked about is the wise man is one who it builds upon the rock, takes his words, builds upon the rock. When the uh, difficulties of life, the, the wind, the floodwaters raise, it's able to withstand it, but the one who is foolish is like the one who built their house upon sand. When the difficulties came, well, it didn't withstand. But what's interesting is not that there was a building or the materials at the building, but the foundation that was built on. That is what's important. If our homes are built upon a bad foundation, we are not going to have a house very long. We're going to see problems appearing. We're going to see cracks. We're going to see you know, doors not shutting correctly. The foundation is shifting, and if the foundation is very bad, the house will come tumbling in. I remember seeing a house one time that was a nice house, but it was literally split in the middle because it had foundational problems. Beautiful on the outside, well, to a point, until you started to see that things weren't right. The house had to be torn down. You can use the best materials to build a house, but if your foundation isn't good, you will have a house that will come collapsing. What about your spiritual foundation? Are you building on a strong spiritual foundation? Are you building on a weak foundation? Make sure that your foundation is strong. And what is this foundation? Well, part of that foundation is found in John chapter 10, 10. I'm reading from the Aramaic scripture here, so it may look a little different. Doesn't a thief only come so that he might steal and kill and destroy? I have come so that they may have lives for them and may have that which is abundant for them. 
when people ask me, say, well, what's the purpose of Jesus coming down on earth? Why did Jesus come down on earth? And again, the answer is, well, to come die on a cross. Yes, but that's only part of the truth. Jesus says here in John chapter 10, verse 10, why he came, and it's simply this, so that they may have lives for them and may have that which is abundant for them. God wants to give us life, and he wants to give it to us abundantly. We're not talking about the physical, our health, or our wealth. Jesus never promised that our health would always be good. He never promised that we'd have riches or wealth. He did promise us that we can have strong spiritual truth. We can have a life of the Spirit, of joy, of peace, of contentment, you name it. We've got it in the spiritual realms. That's why we have to ensure that we lay for ourselves treasures in heaven. Those are the heavenly treasures. The heavenly treasures are peace, joy, contentment. We're not always frustrated. We deal with whatever is thrown at us, and we can handle it courageously. We have no fear. Wow, what a life. The good news is just that. The good news is that we can have it. You and I can experience that. Of course, Jesus again in 1010 talks about how thieves come in and destroy the physical world. They, someone breaks into your house. They break things apart. They, they steal what you have, or they destroy your house, or even maybe even kill you. It's the same way in the spiritual sense. See, in the spiritual sense, we have individuals, we have evil forces that come in and try to rob us of our joy. They steal us and are still from us. And their real purpose is to destroy our lives to where we live in constant just misery and nothing. That's not life that Jesus promised. Jesus promised, no matter the situation you're in, and I want you to listen to this because this is very, very important. When Jesus said, I've come to give you life and have it abundantly, what maybe your version says, he means it. He really, truly means it. It's not a promise for, well, for most people, but the rest of us got to go over here. No. Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and to have it abundantly. End of discussion. Anybody can have it if they surrender their lives and focus on the things that are needed for it. That's important because many people, and I I cannot stress this enough, many people think that, yeah, it's good for some people, but others, we need something else. No, that's not true because our problems come from where our mind is. And we're going to be talking about that in just a second. But I want us to look at another verse here, Romans chapter 5, verse 17. And I've highlighted some key words in here. So follow along with me and understand this is the another stone in that foundation if you, if you want to look at it that way. For if death reigned because of the foolishness of the one, those who received the multitude of grace and of the gift and of righteousness will abundantly reign in life through the one, Yeshua, the anointed one. Did you see those key words? Death, grace, gift, righteousness, and reign. Those are important because you see the first one, death. The death that comes from living with a worldly mind, uh, mindset, a worldly, worldly worldview of, of what we can get that's focused just on ourself, that brings the anxiety. Those are bringing the depression. Those are attacks on our ego and so forth. That's what, that's what all this is, stems, uh, is, is happening. It's an attack on us, and we don't know how to deal with it. So we resort to these ways. We handle it and respond in these ways. But look what Paul says here. Will abundantly reign in life through the one, Yeshua, the anointed one. See, we don't have to live in the anxiety, the depression, no purpose, We're no longer bound by death. We're bound by life. Really, I shouldn't say bound by life. We have freedom. We have life. We can go forward. We can handle anything that is thrown at us. That's why the early followers of Jesus were members of the way. They weren't called Christians right off the bat. Those were called Christians later on, and some scholars think that it was a derogatory term. They were called members of the way. The way, because that's what it is, a way. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. Jesus made, you know, references to 
you know, narrows the gate and narrows the way, straight is the way that, that leads to eternal life. He's talking about paths, and these are, this is the, the metaphors, the, the, um, the analogies, the examples that are given to us to understand that this is really a way of living. So understand that we have to have a foundation that this is a way and not just something that's far off. It's a way for today. I'm going to give a definition of the way. This is just my definition. You can come up with a different, different definition maybe, but this is how I've defined it. Living through a spiritual worldview with a mind controlled by the Spirit, empowering us to live the life of Christ. See, this isn't about something for the great hereafter when we all pass away. Maybe what is to come. Yes, we have promises for that, but this is for today. You can live a victorious life because it has been promised to you. You don't have to worry and live in the past state of a, of a bad way of thinking, a bad way of living. You can live a life free of anxiety, free of the depression, free of the fear, because that is the promise that Jesus made to us. So don't get discouraged, though. These things happen. It takes time. Some grow at a different rate. Some grow quicker than others. But don't be discouraged. It will come. So make sure we understand this life is for today. It's not for something for tomorrow. We just kind of have to cope with life. It's for today. We enjoy these things. And number two, this will happen when we have the right spiritual worldview and we operate in the mind of Christ. Those are what the foundational teaching is. So now let's now look at five action, or six rather, actions or steps we can take to ensure that we're building upon the right type of foundation, the, the materials that we need to have to ensure that we're living in the right way. There are many more than six, but I've just rounded off with six here. We'll try to get through some of these, all of these. If we can, great. If not, then we will go and let the Spirit lead us and see where it goes, and we may have to do a part two. So number one, live as a son of or a daughter of God. That is crucial. We have to understand who we are in Christ. We have been made sons and daughters. We seem, seem to forget that. We seem to just kind of think we're over here, and maybe God hopefully will accept us. Turn to John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. But those who have received him, he has given power unto them, so that they may become the sons of God, unto those who are believing in his name. Those who neither from blood nor from the desire of the flesh, and neither from the will of a man, but rather were begotten from God. Your status, if you're a follower of Jesus, is a son or a daughter of God. Now, how and why is that important? Well, I want you to go back to a parable. The parable of the prodigal son. We probably all know it, but if you don't know the, that parable, the son lives a raunchy lifestyle. He wants his inheritance from his father, and he runs out, and he lives just a terrible lifestyle. You name it, he did it. But then he decides, what am I doing in life? This isn't working. I want to go back to my father. Hopefully, he'll take me back. The father sees him. He runs to him. He says, yes, you're my son. He comes back. He tells the servants, hey, take that fatted calf. Let's celebrate. My son has returned home. Well, the other son looks at it and says, well, you know, here I am. I didn't run off and do all these things. That's not right, you know. He didn't throw me a big party. But the response from the father is fantastic. He says that, son, don't you know that when you were with me, all of these things belong to you? They were all yours. But see, your brothers come home and we're celebrating. And we remember that part. But the part I really want us to focus on is what he told the son— all these things belong to you already. This is your home. We have to have the mindset that the things of the spiritual realm belong to those who belong to the Father. They are the gifts that are given to the sons. They're the gifts that are given to the daughters of God. We have to embrace those. We have to take them. We have to use them. God's given them to us, but we're afraid. We don't want to take them. We're not sure. Use them. Utilize them. That's what God has given us. That's what he wants us to have. So understand your portion, your, your responsibility, who you are, your status. Your status is a son or a daughter of God. Are we living that way? 
If we're not thinking that way, then we're always trying to work in a pleasing way. That's why we try to live by law. A, f- a son or a daughter doesn't not do bad things or or stops sinning simply because there's a rule that you can't. They do it. The right type of son or daughter does it because it hurts their father. They want to do things to make their father happy. Versus a person who comes and visits and live in your home, you give them the house rules, right? The son or the daughter doesn't have to worry so much about the house rules. Instead, they live by the Spirit, knowing who they are, and as sons and daughters, they're going to want to please their father. And their father's excited. And their father says, hey, what's in my house is your house. Use them responsibly. Make sure you use those things responsibly. And that's who we are as sons and daughters. And we forget that. And when we forget that, that sows the seeds for, well, we're not really sure who we are. We're not really sure what we're supposed to do. We now have a sense of belonging. As sons and daughters of God, we belong to a family. And as he says here in John, those who neither from blood nor from the desire of the flesh and neither from the will of a man, but rather were begotten from God. So who are the sons and daughters of God? Those who put their faith and their trust in Jesus. So live like a son, live like a daughter. Know who you are. Know your status. Number two, live with a new mind. The mind, I want you to think about it, is like a filter. It's Think about it as a a water filter to your home. It purifies the water that comes into your home. It removes all all the impurities. And so what you have, or at least hope what you have, is pure water. It's all the bad things have been removed that could harm you. And you can enjoy that glass of water, and it feeds your body. Your your thirst is quenched. You're able to use the nutrients that it provides. It's the same way in the spiritual sense. If we purify our minds, because the mind is the filter to the spirit, the thoughts that come into our minds, everything that comes into our mind, who we are, the difficulties, what those things really mean, we're filtering them. And if we're not, well, we should be filtering them. Sometimes we're letting them go by, and we're not filtering those thoughts. And what happens is those thoughts get into our spirits, and our spirits now become depressed. Why? Because there's an impurity that the mind has let through and has impacted the spirit. That's basically what it comes down to. That's why throughout the New Testament, you will find the writers talking about the mind. The mind is what is so important in the development of our spirits. If the mind does not is not filtered, then we can't expect anything else but the spirit to be impacted. So live with a new mind, and live with a new filter is what it basically means. You're filtering the things that come at you. Let's turn here to Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 6. For those who are in the flesh are mindful of the flesh, and those who are of the Spirit are mindful of the Spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death, and the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. An unfiltered mind, see, focuses on fleshly desires. And I'm not talking about the evil things in this world that we're not supposed to do. I'm talking about anything dealing with the self, then attack on my ego an attack on my thinking. Anything that's coming into it, that's of a fleshly nature. But if we focus on the things of the Spirit, then and we filter out the fleshly things, but we have the mind of the Spirit, a spiritual filter, everything is going to filter out those things. That, that mind is going to filter out those things before it gets to our spirit. Look at these verses again, and I've, I've highlighted them. For those who are in the flesh are mindful of the flesh, and those of the Spirit are mindful of the Spirit. Those who are mindful of the flesh, they're focusing on fleshly things. Those of the spiritual mindset are focusing on the spiritual things. Not a mixture of the both. It's one or the other. Look at the next part of the verse. For the mind of the flesh is death, and the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. See, the filter that we have our minds. If it's on flesh, it's going to be death. 
It's going to bring death to what? Death to our spirits. That's where the discouragement, the anxiety, the the fear, the lack of courage, the, the depression, the worry, you name it, those are where those come from because we're focusing on fleshly things, the things that we think are important but are really not important. But the mind of the Spirit, again, highlighted here, the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. So the mind that is the filter, it's filtering things that are impure, but it's focusing on the pure things, life and peace. So what happens is something comes into our mind, into our life. Our mind takes it. It starts discerning it. It starts saying, what does this mean? What does this mean? Now, the mind that's controlled by the flesh is going to do this. It's going to say, well, that person, they they said those things. Well, that person's a mean person. I don't like them, and I've got hatred toward them, or or whatever the case. But the mind of the Spirit is going to say, what does this really mean? What's really taking place in this? Oh, I know what this is. This is spiritual attack. What this person is doing, they don't realize maybe what they're doing this. Or if they realize what they're doing, it's still, I'm going to focus on peace and life. Because it's going to go to our spirit, no matter what. We got Something is going to go to our spirit to keep it alive. When that mind starts, what, what we do, the mind is focusing on life and peace. It says, okay, what is life? What is peace? That can get through. The rest of it, I'm not going to let that through. That's how peaceful people live. That's how spiritually minded people live. The spiritually minded people will focus on the things of the Spirit. And what's the Spirit's will? The Spirit's will is that you and I have an abundant life. So make sure that we have the right mind. Live with a new mind. Change a filter. Maybe we just need to put a filter in because some people don't even really have a mind to think things through, do they, at times? Have the right filter. Ensure that your mind is filtering the impurities of the spiritual world. Filter out those things that are wrong, that are going to hurt your spirit. Instead, have the mind of the spirit that is only going to want to keep those things of the spiritual nature and says, yes, I will let that pass through and get to my spirit. The rest of it, filter it out, jettison it, it's gone. It's not easy. No one says that this life is easy. See, that's the thing. We we think that the Christian life should be easy. It's not easy. It's a process. Don't become discouraged, please. Focus on the spiritual aspects of things. I can't stress that enough, and I know I'm repeating it, but it's so important if you want to enjoy life in the Spirit. That's what it's about. So understand, when we do these things, we can start dealing with the discouragement, the anxiety, the worry, the fear. Turn again to another verse here, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I require from you then, my brothers, by the mercies of God, that you be maintaining your bodies as a living and holy and acceptable sacrifice unto God in pure worship, and do not be compared to this world, but rather be changed by the renovation of your thoughts and be distinguishing that which is the will of God, the good, the acceptable, and the perfect. Have you ever renovated a house? I had a neighbor once that tore everything down. The foundation was good, but they had to tear out the sheetrock. They tore out the, the, out the, off the roof. They, they tore out the air conditioning system. And all you had was just a house on a foundation with a bunch of studs taken out or, or left in place and a framework. That was it. And even part of it was even removed. That's what we have to do with our minds. We have to renovate our minds, much like what we do that house. We have to remove all that junk that's in our mind, all the things that are just not true. And what we have to do is restructure it in a godly way. Renovation of our thoughts. And when we renovate our thoughts, we can start distinguishing what the will of God is versus the will of me, the will of the self the will of what the world tells me what's important. Instead, we have the Spirit telling us what's important. And the Spirit communicates with us. He tells us. He helps us. He helps us to know what the will of God is. Because only a renovated mind can find true clarity. If we want clarity, we have to have a renovated mind. And then we can know what God's good and acceptable 
and perfect will is, and we can enjoy life. That's the purpose and the reason of having a good and renewed mind. Third one, live with new purpose. Have you ever seen people who are always asking, what is my purpose in life? What's the true meaning of life? What am I supposed to do? And some will tell you it's all about hitting the weight room, hitting the gym. Yeah, hitting the gym's fine, and I love doing those kind of things. Uh, building wealth, building your empire, being an entrepreneur, or doing the things that you feel about what you want. Those are your purposes in life. You know, those things are good to, an ex to a certain extent. But in reality, those will all disappear. Did not Solomon say in the book of Ecclesiastes that vanity, vanity, all this is vain. Meaningless, meaningless. All this is meaningless. It has no real true meaning. Yes, you might build an empire, but that empire one day is going to come crashing down. Yeah, you could have the best body in the world, but you know, one day you're going to get old and it's not going to be as good as what it was. All these things have a short shelf life. What really is true purposeful living is living for the Spirit, living for God. And that's what Solomon said at the end of Ecclesiastes. So what is our purpose? Our purpose is to live the life of Christ. It's to have the life that develops us into Christ. I want you now to look at uh, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Let it be all joy unto you, my brothers, when you enter into various and many trials, for you know that the trying of faith provides patience for you. Yet unto patience, let there be to it a complete work, so that you might be mature and perfect, and in nothing be deficient. We're having a, a mind that's now starting to filter things out, and part of the filtering things out is just not filtering out the bad things, but filtering out what purposes in life are really all about. And that's really a, a different level of spiritual growth. That's when we start growing a little bit more. We can start now seeing what are the purposes of life, which number one means that I now start living for God, but what does that even mean in a sense? But also, what is the purpose of living if I'm dealing with great difficulties? And some of you are dealing with extremely extremely difficult situations, situations in which I would never experience. You're dealing with things, with challenges in life that would be so difficult and are difficult to overcome. The thing is, is we have to deal with them, and how are we going to deal with them? So we now have a new purpose in life, and that new purpose in life is no longer about what we can create here on earth, but what we can lay in store in the heavenly realms. And those things, interestingly enough, come from adversities, from difficulties. Now, some difficulties are greater than others, but I want us to be able to filter these things and look at them in what they produce. So go back and look at this verse here in James. Let it be all joy unto you, my brothers, when you enter into various and many trials, for you know that the trying of faith provides patience for you. Yet unto patience, let there be to it a complete work, so that you might be mature and perfect, and in nothing be deficient. The joy is, and not just a little bit of the joy, but all joy means that the difficulties in life, the things that we're going through, help us to be mature, help us to be complete. Suffering, if it's handled correctly, if it's filtered correctly, allows us to have and to live in a new purpose. And that new purpose now is for what? To be mature, complete, not lacking in anything, not to be deficient in anything. That's our new purpose now. Our purpose is to take the sufferings that we have and embrace them so we can be mature, complete, not lacking in anything. See, the other mind, the one that is not filtering, the, one, the, the mind that is controlled by the flesh, says, no, I don't want the suffering. Push those sufferings away. I will do everything I can to get rid of it. I will not embrace any suffering whatsoever. We fight the suffering. And yes, I'm not saying we want to run after suffering, but if we're suffering for things and we're going through difficulties in life that where it's outside of our control, 
Jesus embraced them. And what James is saying is that when we embrace them, we become complete. We become mature. We become perfect, not lacking in anything, because our faith is being tested and our patience is being developed. We become like Christ. See, we have to rethink our purpose in life. We have to, instead of living in a mind that says, I don't want any suffering whatsoever, and of course, nobody wants suffering, but we know that suffering is coming. But the Christian takes that suffering and says, I can use this to the glory of God, and that glory of God is not some catchphrase in which we say, oh, it's for the glory of God. The glory of God is the fact that we're becoming like Jesus if we handle it correctly. That is what's really taking place. We're becoming mature, complete, not lacking anything. That's what the spiritual does. The spiritual mind filters those things, and instead of reacting, it says, okay, what am I going to do with this? I can handle the difficulty knowing that if I handle it correctly, I am becoming more like Christ. I'm becoming more patient. I'm becoming more mature. I'm becoming more complete. I'm becoming perfect. And that's what that word perfect means. I'm becoming more like Christ. And should not that be my goal? That's how Jesus uh, wants us to live. That's what Jesus did. That's how he did. He has embraced his suffering and became an example for us that we can embrace our suffering. So we're looking at it with a new mind. Again, the worldly mind looks at it only in a worldly sense. It's bad. I don't want it, and that's it. The spiritual mind takes it and changes it and starts looking at it and says, what can I do? That's why it's called all joy. Look at that first part of the verse again. Let it be all joy unto you, my brothers, when you enter into various and many trials. How can I count this as all joy? Nobody thinks this is joyful. Remember, Jesus went to the cross, and he was joyful about it. So joyful isn't some yippee, I'm looking forward to these things. Jesus did not say, wow, I can't wait to go to the cross. How exciting. But what Jesus did is he knew It was for a purpose, and our suffering is for a purpose because we're being made like him. That's why the spiritual world is the spiritual world is is like that. That's that's why it's so exciting to live in the spirit, because we know we're being made perfect like Jesus. So let's recap these. We're gonna have to make another video. I want to recap these here. So We'll look at the other three at, at, on, on our next video, but let's recap the ones we have. Number one, live as a son or a daughter of God. Know your status in this world. Know who you are. Know who you've been created to be, a son or a daughter of the Most High, who can enjoy the blessings that the Father has given you in this life. The spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms are ours. They belong to us. We're children of God. They're ours to use and ours to take. Number two, live with a new mind. Your mind is your filter. Filter out what's good. Filter out what's bad. Filter out the things of death. Filter out in the things of the Spirit. And number three, live with a new purpose. Your purpose for living is not about how much you can accumulate. It's not about how much suffering you can escape. Your purpose now is to be made into the image of Jesus Christ, and being made into that image of Christ can only be done through suffering. Metal is shaped by heating it up. Sometimes life has to heat us up so we can be bent and shaped in the way that the Father wants us. Like, subscribe, share, leave a comment, and we'll see you on the next video where we will look at three more areas and actions that we can take to build and enjoy the life of Christ. God bless.